isolation. A sensation that we all fear in some form or fashion. The concept of being left within a void of nothingness with no one around to help. It is indescribable. However, when this notion is presented in something as intricate and immersive as a video game, it consumes you. Throughout the years, psychological horror has been a staple in the realm of video games. The idea of enveloping ourselves in an uncanny reality just off enough to know that something is wrong is a concept that I've grown to appreciate more and more the further I experience it. In 1999, we endured the fogged hellscape for the very first time. It was a venture based upon a simple premise, finding our daughter after a freak accident. Unbeknownst to us back then, what awaited us wasn't just a simple quest of discovery. It was a one-way ticket for Harry to face an onslaught of demons to fight for the soul of his little girl. It was a slow burn story that unraveled through discovery, with environments shrouded in darkness, enemies pulled straight from a fever dream, and ambience filling the air with isolated dread, making for a golden combination. Silent Hill became a powerhouse, a pioneer of ideas caused by the limitations of the time period. It and the three sequels that released over the next five years had set a foundation that other game studios would follow for years to come. And even today, games are releasing with a clear inspiration from it. Out of all of them though, the one we're going to talk about tonight was born 15 years ago and bears a premise centered around one simple question. Are you afraid? Afraid of Monsters Director's Cut is a 2007 Half-Life 1 mod created by Team Sykeskeller, the group who'd later go on to create the revered cry of fear in Resident Evil Cold Blood. Led by Andreas Ronberg, also known as Rumpel, and James Marchant, the group took heavy inspiration from earlier survival horror titles like the aforementioned Silent Hill and Resident Evil. Throughout the game, we can see these ideas in action as it carries a heavy focus on strategic timing and resource management, instilling much of these same fight or flight sensations we get from those that came before it. Now, Afraid of Monsters is a dated title built upon an engine that's pushing 24 years old. To me, it gives it this special uniqueness as the limitations that carried over from Half-Life, like the terrible flashlight and the lack of a dedicated inventory, make for a game that is admittedly tense and horrifying. On top of this, the game bears a story that has stood the test of time. It's multifaceted, with various endings to uncover depending on your actions in the later half of your journey. There, surprisingly, is a lot to find within Afraid of Monsters, and tonight, I aim to bring you into that world with me. From here on, this video will contain spoilers, so if you'd like to play this for yourself, I'd click off and come back later. Or stay. You do you. <laughs> with camera shots around a hospital named Markland. It is barren, cold, and empty, establishing a mood of desolation from the outset. Eventually, we see a man who will soon come to know as our main character, named David Leatherhoff. We find that he is broken, with an addiction to pills that have effectively consumed his life. The reason he's at Markland in the first place is to get help. However, bizarrely, the second he enters the bathroom, a strange temptation awaits him. I really need to take these pills. I 
I can't stop taking them. Damn it. David takes the pills, unable to resist, and immediately after, the stall opens, beckoning for us to enter. And so, we do. At this point, we're already a far cry from where we started. Surrounding us are foreboding hand-drawn trees, boxes, eyes, and messages that make little to no sense at all. It's disorienting, in a way, yet the only thing we know to do are to follow the arrows. Eventually, we find another stall telling us to follow the red, and after this, we press the re-platforming section in complete darkness. I'll circle back to how annoying this was later on. But let me just say that platforming and Half-Life are like McNuggets and, I don't know, fucking mayonnaise? They don't exactly mesh, if you know what I mean. Anyway, upon escaping this sequence, we wake up back in Markland, realizing that since we took those pills, we had passed out. What we were experiencing was a nightmare. That's why the controls during the platforming section were so goddamn bad. Bizarrely, the mirror is displaying the same ice symbol we saw in our dream and we have no idea how or why it's there. It seems like something's messing with us, but David has no inclination that anyone would be. Moving on, we're given free reign to explore Markland, and since we were passed out for hours, the hospital seems to be closed with quite literally no one around. Upon checking out a few other rooms, we can notice various horror tropes begin to sink their little tendrils into us. Fingers pop out in the corner of our eyes, Movement can be heard down hallways, but just distinct enough that we question if it's the game or if our mind's playing tricks on us. Windows begin to break behind us, and disturbing transformations of otherwise ordinary locations happen with our back turned. Things are just off enough to know that something is wrong, and it's almost like David's still in a nightmare. Anyway, after exploring the back room, fuck, the hospital, <sighs> Let's talk about that real quick. Liminality is something you may have heard of before. It's this like relatively unknown thing called the back rooms that... Fuck. Liminality is defined as places and things that are of, related to, or situated at a sensory threshold. <laughs> Wait, what? You might find a feeling of liminality at grandma's house when no one's home. At your local mall that hasn't been updated since 1996 through pictures of an old cafeteria. And maybe, if you're feeling frisky, in Peach's Castle and Mario 64 whenever you're by yourself and no one's around to help. <laughs> Liminality can be anywhere, represented by that uncanny feeling of something derelict that was once full of life being left behind in the time period you remember it from. In the case of Afraid of Monsters, I like to say that this game is one big-ass liminal space which just adds to how eerie it comes off. The corridors, the streets, the sewers, the houses, all of them instill the same sense of unease, the nostalgic confusion of this being a place that is not what could be, but is a reminder of the reality of what once was. In the world we're in, not a single other human being is present. We are, for all intents and purposes, stuck in this nightmare alone but of course david doesn't know that while exploring the hospital david stumbles upon a mesh of electrified wires forcing us to have to shut the power off to proceed in our hunt for the breaker box we encounter a gun which if you know anything about horror games isn't ever a good thing Soon after, we finally find the power switch, and at this point, we're left with a decision. We can take the blue pill, turning back and forever living within this isolated purgatory of nothingness, or we can take the red pill and flip that switch 
and see just how far the rabbit hole goes. At this point, the game begins. David's reality has officially warped into something so far gone, so far out of the realm of logic, that he's faced with no other choice but to fight onward. The previously empty, barren hallways are now overrun with twitching zombified doctors known as Twitchers and are all out on one mission, to ensure David's death. And with just a measly knife and a few bullets in your handgun, the game shifts from exploration to full-on survival horror. Not only are you tasked with managing your ammunition, but also the batteries in your flashlight, which for new players can seem incredibly sparse, further adding to the already agonizing tension that the game throws at you. Furthermore, pills are your primary source of health replenishment, which, considering the nightmare sequence and the entire reason he's at Marklin in the first place, is an interesting detail. What exactly are these pills doing to him? After finding numerous switches that unlock specific doors within this labyrinthine hospital, we eventually make our way through the basement and out to the parking garage in hopes of finding anyone that can help. If the hospital's overrun with monsters, surely someone in the surrounding city streets can help. But once we make it out there, we realize that this optimism is unfounded. The monsters become worse, increasing their onslaught in greater numbers as David struggles to figure out what the fuck is going on here. He fights through the city streets and apartment buildings, unlocking pathways guiding him forward. Along the way, hand crabs, wheelchair twitchers, one-eyed dogs, these lanky abominations, and even invisible face things are all up to get him, and it never lets up. After venturing through the city, David encounters a car which he steals in hopes to escape. Strangely, this car sequence is represented by yet another nightmare scene involving him navigating through a maze guided by street signs that will lie to you. If he follows them blindly, he dies, which seems to allude to the notion that in this hellscape, he is completely lost. He's escaping, sure, but where to? Not a goddamn clue. David's car crashes in the woods, and his hopeful escape is soured. With no other choice, he's left to wander once more to see what he can find. Anyone. Anywhere. The forest is one of the last areas of the game, containing numerous houses and pathways, surrounded by complete darkness. It's here where David's truly put to the test, as inventory management, specifically when it comes to his flashlight battery, becomes the most important part of survival. If he runs out, it's complete darkness. Yet, if he endures, he'll eventually find his way to a mansion full of invisible enemies, disturbing artwork, and bleeding rooms. Things are quickly becoming more senseless. However, he's this far in. Might as well keep going. After escaping the mansion, David encounters a boat leading him to a house. By outward appearances, it seems like one of the more ordinary locations in the game. It's full of twitchers, however when he encounters the bathroom, a bloody message on the mirror tells him what he needs to do. A fireplace in the mansion houses a sacred path, and upon entering it, it leads David into a reality so far gone that he now accepts that he is past the point of no return. Blood covers the walls. A constant heartbeat thumps in the ambience. Hallucinations become more frequent, and the world around him becomes increasingly twisted and molded into something unrecognizable. Our save file, this location is apparently called Heaven. However, it's clear that that's a lie. This is Hell. The nightmare sequence begins to blend with reality. 
we can no longer discern if we are actually awake. We navigate the red dots leading us to a caged platform. One last switch takes off one last onslaught. And after escaping, a beacon of light beckons from the distance. A light at the end of a tunnel. With no other way to turn, we chase it as an ear-piercing ring consumes us. And then, almost there. David is a murderer. This entire time, he's been experiencing a terrible trip, leading him through a murderous rampage with bodies littered throughout his house. The Twitchers, the beings we feared throughout our entire adventure, weren't monsters at all. It was people trying to help us, trying to stop us, because they weren't the demons. It was us. In the original Afraid of Monsters, this was the one and only ending. A story about a man caught up within his own mind, leading to the deaths of innocent bystanders. Interestingly, in the director's cut, they added three other endings that completely flipped this one on his head. You'd need a keen eye to get them, however, as they require you to stray from the beaten path. Eh, not really my type of thing though, so I'ma just end the video now. So, um, okay. In the city, there are alternate paths you can take, leading to areas previously closed off in the original playthrough. This leads to later changes in enemy density and placement, throwing you off guard when you think you're ready for an enemy encounter. Once you make it to the end of the game, you approach the tunnel as you did before. This time, you're able to get closer and closer to the light before the ending sequence plays out. And once you finally do, ending two takes place inside of a police station and largely appears to be an extension of the first one. Here, David's undergoing interrogation about his killing spray, however, can't remember any of it. In ending three, it takes it even further, with the officer reading a newspaper about what he'd done. Given the existence of this paper, we can assume that David's been locked up for days and might never be released. Following this, we cut to the guard doing a routine checkup. He approaches David's cell and opens the porthole. However, inside, David killed himself. He couldn't live with the pain of knowing that he took so many lives while under the influence of something so destructive for him that he decided he would go too. Eerily, all of these seem to be different portions of one larger sequence of events. Ending one, David's caught. Ending two, he's being questioned. And ending three, he takes his own life. Some might consider this to be the story. However, there is still one more that stands apart from the others. Throughout the game, you'll stumble upon bloody notes containing various letters and numbers. E, O, G, F, M, I, V, blank, R, and E. At first, it seems like nothing. However, given the in-game hints, we later realize that when arranged correctly, we get a phrase. Forgive me. This is our key for the end of the game when we're given two distinct paths. Taking this left one leads us to a door surrounded by numbers, and after entering this code, 
were granted access to a new area officially called Hell. Oh, this ain't that bad. Here, we're faced with a warped version of the reality we previously endured, yet with no monsters in sight. We follow the dots until we finally witness the reason we're here in the first place. Not because of the demons around us, but rather the demon within us. This final fight is a one-on-one, -on -one, all-out deathmatch against our addiction, the thing destroying us this entire time. There's an interesting catch that if David stays to fight it with conventional weapons, he dies, and so he's left with no other option than to retreat to a room with a spear. Upon grabbing it, we realize that this is the only tool we're able to use against this monster, and so we relentlessly jab away at it while it takes the damage without so much of a flinch. David's addiction had become so strong that it overcame him, leaving this fight as one of the most difficult in the game. It tears weapons out of its chest, the ones you use during your journey up to this point. Electricity rains down, striking him, setting him ablaze. It's almost demonic. It's here where David either falters, gives in, and lets his addiction continue to defeat him, or he overpowers it for good. Completely removed from every other ending, David wakes up at Markland. All along, the doctors were trying to help him after he passed out in the bathroom. All of this was nothing but a near-death experience. I believe that this ending is the real one, being a bit more meta than the other three. The difference between him waking up and dying, however, depends on if you take the route of repentance. As we can recall, Forgive Me is the key to the good ending, and it's the only one in which David confronts the monster plaguing his life. Had he not, then we get the other endings that all result in death. I may catch some flack here, but I believe that these endings too are all taken place while David's still under at Markland. The death in the jail cell was symbolic, with the real world parallel being that he flatlined in that hospital bed. I think those are the two diverging storylines at play here and it all depends on the narrative that you decide to chase. Take the easy way out, run from the final wave of enemies, and chase that light at the end of the tunnel, and you'll get what you wish for. But go out of your way to figure out what the fuck's going on and break that cycle? And David Leatherhoff finds a new lease on life. As you can tell, Afraid of Monsters is a game with a considerable amount of lore that can be left up to interpretation, and given that this mod released in 2007, I'm astonished how well it holds up today. The environments and soundscapes are some of the most well done parts of this game, and immersion quickly grips you when you least expect it. To be honest, Team Sykeskeller nailed it with the map design, starting the game with something simple and recognizable, an ordinary hospital by outward appearances yet harboring subtle hints alluding to the fact that something isn't right. We anticipate someone, anyone, to show up to help. Yet we are alone, left within an agonizing silence. Past the hospital, when David's exploring the city sewers, our ears are filled with nothing but the sound of flowing sewage, twitchers groaning, and an ambience convincing us that we are not alone here. The visuals of a massive, open labyrinth drive home a sensation that larger, unforeseen monsters are stalking in the distance, even though they aren't. 
in a random home deep within a forest that we are completely engulfed by, scouting for any trace of the already scant amount of resources available to us, lest we find none, leaving us entrenched in darkness. These homes are slivers of normalcy, of a life gone by that we're unsure if we'll ever experience again. Deep within a mansion inhabited by beings otherworldly, David's mind is at a point to which he's questioning what's actually real. He's been taking pills throughout the entire game. What is it doing to him? Disturbing paintings litter the walls. The attic is bleeding. What the fuck is even real anymore? And stuck within the hellscape that is our own mind. A world so far gone from reality as we understand it. The walls are alive. Screams fill our ears as anxiety overcomes us. We are, for all intents and purposes, in too deep to turn back. This game does this phenomenally, compounding with its limitations to create a unique, almost N64-like horror experience. Throughout the game, there's a lot that's left up to imagination, since the texturing and models are so rudimentary. To me, it adds to the immersion, as we aren't ever really given a good look at any enemy in the game, mostly due to the in-game lighting and the limitations from the flashlight. This forces us to play much of the game in darkness when we otherwise wouldn't, allowing our minds to fill in the gaps for what we are unable to discern. But when we do decide to utilize it, the illumination is so bizarre that it makes enemy encounters horrifying. This, atop a compelling multifaceted story with solid enemy variety, intricately crafted environments, and an immersion factor that is impeccably done, Afraid of Monsters brings quite a bit to the table considering it's a mod of a video game that was released in 1998. That is insane. Now, while Afraid of Monsters shines in many aspects, there are quite a few inconveniences that I had, partly because of design choices and partly because of the archaic engine that this mod was built upon. To preface this, I do not want to come off as cynical. I understand the game's age, and I know Cry of Fear addresses most of this, video on that later. Do not get me wrong, this experience shines when it's at its best. However, the issues I have with it seem to begin right when we start the game. One of the first gameplay sequences you're introduced to is The Nightmare, which I believe at first is impeccably done. The hand-drawn environments set an expectation that we're about to go down a rabbit hole of abstract weirdness. However, that never materializes. Instead, we're immediately thrown down a toilet and forced to endure a frustratingly janky platforming sequence that bears quite the learning curve. Once you finally get a rhythm down on how to stay atop the narrow-ass path that your character default sprints across, the game then decides to throw some last-minute surprises your way. It is maddening having to deal with something that really has no need to be there at all. Thankfully, it isn't a very common occurrence, but anytime you have to platform, you're left at the mercy of the Half-Life 1 mechanics. Another issue I ran into is something subjective and honestly kind of silly, but from a new player's perspective, it was a little frustrating. For starters, this game has no map, which I can't fault the devs for because it's built on an engine that doesn't have one. On top of this, the game has a massive focus on resource management that becomes completely unforgiving once you shut the power off in Markland. If you do not check every single room available to you, leaving behind any batteries or ammo before you hit that switch, you're fucked without a gun, and even then you'll be navigating in complete darkness if you're out of battery while you wait for it to gradually charge up to a menial 5%. If you become stuck in this situation, you're effectively left to either struggle through it or restart a new game to check every single door to be sure you don't miss anything. Hmm, the lock seems to be jammed, it's not gonna open. Hmm. 
The lock seems to be jammed. It's not gonna open. Hmm. The lock seems to be jammed. Hmm. It's not gonna open. The lock Strange. seems to be jammed. The, the door lock is locked. missing. To the this lock door. seems to be the jammed. Seems to be it's jammed. not going to open. Strange. The lock seems the lock to be jammed. To this door. It's not going to open. This problem lessens later on, but in Marklin Hospital, you'll be hearing that quite a bit. It's not gonna open. Let's talk enemy density. This really became apparent in the later portion of the city in which I was tasked with flipping four switches to open a gate. Here, about 20 sprinting twitchers bombard you, and if you don't have any ammo or battery left, like I had, this section is considerably harder than it otherwise would be. This left me having to pick them off one by one from this hallway as I quick saved after each one, but God damn it! I really wish there was a way to stockpile pills as I believe it could have helped a bit. Either that or at the very least respawning with more than 4 HP like god damn that's one hit give me a break. Much of this same issue came during the car nightmare sequence with the road signs. Once again I was left with next to no health, no ammo and hardly any battery leaving me to power through these enemies using just melee. To add insult to injury, the road signs misguide you, and down these hallways, you can also see pills in the distance. However, if you approach them like a fucking pleb, for the uninitiated, this is painstakingly frustrating painting an otherwise incredibly immersive story-driven experience. Aside from that, being undersupplied in critical scenarios, the annoying platforming, and being left in complete darkness if you don't scavenge every corner of the map, Afraid of Monsters is a highly respectable gold source mod that still holds up to this day, and it's got a hell of a lot to offer. Hidden secrets, numerous endings, and gameplay that, when you're properly stocked up, is actually really engaging. On top of that, the immersion you get is fantastic given the time of its release, and even with the limitations of the engine it was built upon, I do recommend that you give this game a run. The environments are fleshed out, the map design keeps you engaged, exploration is always encouraged, and if you're up for a challenge, the game does not hold back on rewarding you for discovery. Afraid of monsters walked so cry of fear could run, and if you're wondering why the hell I talked about this tonight, it's because I'm paving the path for further analytical horror retrospectives much like this one. This game has an incredible sequel, with a story even deeper than what we discussed tonight. So if you're into that, I'd love for you to stick around for these passion projects that I am thrilled to bring to the table. Thank you all for being here on this new venture of mine. Seriously, it truly means the world to me, and I hope, at the very least, that I took you on a small adventure through one of the coolest free Half-Life mods out there. Afraid of Monsters is a story. A story about a broken man consumed by an addiction that he has lost control of. What began as a tale about a man going to get help had devolved into a calamitous journey through a reality that we can only question. David's mind devolved further and further towards madness the deeper down the rabbit hole he went. And even at the conclusion, the big reveal, it still left us with more questions than answers. What actually was real? Is David alive? Are the monsters a product of David's circumstances, or were they always hidden within him? At the end of it all, these are the questions that we're faced with. We were never really given an answer, and are rather left to choose the one that we believe to be true. And while that might seem unnecessary to some, I believe that's what makes this mod, the tragic story of David Leatherhoff, one of the best Gold Source projects that have ever been made.